Hi, welcome to episode four of The Focus. I'm Aldo Rall. And I'm Horia Sloshansky. Welcome. So today we are continuing exploring the um, polarities or the adaptive oversight balances. Uh, and what Horia is showing there today is uh, the little scale there between the iron, uh, iron triangle and the agile triangle. And in the galaxy view, it's, to, it's the next uh, two parts of the hexagon uh, along. And just as a reminder, how we will be stepping through this uh, again is going back to the polarity map is we are definitely first going to the bottom left of that picture um, uh, on the one polarity uh, and uh, looking at uh, the current struggle patterns. Then we'll be going to the top right is to look at the desired outcomes of the uh, alternative or the uh, other pole, and then go down to risks when overcorrecting uh, of the other pole, and then go back to benefits to be retained of the original pole. We then want to look at what is the overall purpose, number five there on the polarity map, when we have the best of both worlds, and then what is it that we fear from both worlds? What's the combined downside of the two polarities? We'll then look into actions and skills, as well as early warning signs that we can imply, measurable warning signs that we can put in place that, that, that can prevent us from dropping back into the bottom of the downside of both of those. Now, we are looking at the Agile and Iron Triangle today. And just as a reminder that the Iron Triangle is traditionally from the world of project management, where you have to balance scope, time and budget. And whereas the Agile Triangle, they look at value, quality and constraints, which is actually the constraints as described in the Iron Triangle. So that's just at a high level, and we'll go into a little bit more depth about why about the iron and agile triangle. But first, let's step back and ask Horia, why did we choose on balancing these two um, in the adaptive oversight galaxy? Mm, thank you, Aldo. The key observation is that, let's say about 20 years ago, we've seen a rapidly accelerating pace of change. People talk about increased volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Uh, these factors have accelerated the way we look at work initiatives. 20 years ago, a project would be anywhere from 18 to 36 months. Those would be the average project durations. And the public was reasonably comfortable with waiting a fair bit until you get a result. Now, these days, um, the pace of change has increased so much that hardly anyone is comfortable waiting another 18 months for some outcome to manifest. We have grown so accustomed to instant gratification. We want to see changes within days and weeks as opposed to months. Now, another significant transition has been the move from projects and projects and projects to more product development. So the project to product uh, balance shift has further complicated uh, matters. So the balance between medium to longer term planning that the project discipline brings and the short-term delivery focus that the project management and project delivery activities bring, that's something that needs to be resolved. It doesn't mean that it has to be either one or the other. It's more a matter of how do we balance both? So how do we help people to develop a better product mindset when they've been accustomed so much with projects and projects and projects? And how do we get people in a project universe to appreciate the benefits of rigorous and effective project management? Now, another key factor that comes into this is the approach to funding. Funding models have changed 
uh, quite a bit as well. And not only that, even accounting models. Um, you may be familiar with the idea of throughput accounting. That is a significant advancement over cost-based accounting. And um, the organizations that actively consider and embrace some of the concepts of throughput accounting develop a distinct advantage over organizations that just use cost-based accounting. These are all factors that are well worth considering in this blend of iron versus agile triangle. Now, the last element that I want to emphasize is in the iron triangle, there was the unspoken assumption that the scope is um, fairly guaranteed to be valuable because projects typically came in the form of some form of physical uh, demonstrable thing that we're building. In other words, if I'm putting uh, up a skyscraper, the value is, hey, the skyscraper is available. If I'm building a bridge or a road, um, the value is of a thing being built. And that's why earned value management um, is um, a little bit um, weak um, from the perspective of software intensive systems development, because in the more knowledge work oriented uh, disciplines, the value of the thing that's envisaged to be built cannot be guaranteed. Because I have an idea that this product is going to be awesome, you're going to love it. And turns out that the public doesn't share my excitement. The public goes, nah, not interested. We don't like it. So it's not like with the road. Well, we put the road in. Hey, you're going to have to use the road. Like it or not, that's the road. That's where you can take your car. You're going to use the road. Um, whereas with software intensive systems, if the intended customers don't appreciate, uh, don't use the provided for system, Nope, value is not there. And this is why the scope time budget, iron triangle, is insufficient. Because the scope cannot be guaranteed to be valuable. This is where the agile triangle comes into play and says, you know what? Um, a product has to be on value. It has to deliver appreciated value by the intended stakeholders. It has to provide quality. Because, yeah, you give me value, but the quality is so poor that I can hardly get at the, at the value. That's no good. And finally, I still cannot let go of the constraints. I still only have this many people, this much time, this much money. So, therefore, um, I have to find out what's the optimum amount of value with an acceptable degree of quality that I can achieve within the given set of constraints. So, that's the essence of why we need to consider not just the iron triangle, because hey, uh, scope, time, and budget are still elements that need to be um, balanced, um, but we need to add to that the value and the quality. But Horia, those are not the only constraints, the scope, time, and budget uh, constraints. There are other constraints as oh, well yeah. that, we, that we've noticed, and mm -hmm. some of them are related to um, the human condition. Some of those constraints in your context are related to how humans behave, and you'll notice, and, and even their habits, and you'll notice when we step through the eight panels, <laughs> some of those come through quite, <laughs> quite strongly. So... A question here around those constraints. Um, we've got the, the traditional constraints of scope, time, and budget. We've got the human condition. What other, uh, what other types of typical constraints um, do, you, do we notice out there? Well, um, that depends very much on the industry um, that uh, we find ourselves in. There are also uh, cultural peculiarities, uh, if you will, there are psychological elements, there are um, numerous other um, contributing factors, I suppose. Now, if we're talking about constraints, it's really interesting to notice that there's a whole range of concerns that can become constraints. So for instance, when we're chartering uh, teams, we talk about assessing risks and issues and assumptions and dependencies. And 
sometimes even opportunities in addition to constraints. Because uh, all of these can become constraints. A risk, when it materializes, may become an issue. That issue, if it becomes acute, may become a constraint. An assumption, if proven false, can become an issue, which then may exacerbate into another constraint. Now, one other concept that I'd like to surface is the idea that constraints aren't necessarily evil. Constraints can actually be tremendously liberating. Constraints can be tremendously enabling. Here are a couple of examples. Uh, Dr. Shina Yengar has done a lot of research on choice. Um, and there are some classic examples of this. She put in one supermarket a table with 24 different types of jars of jam, and in a different supermarket, only six uh, different jars of jam um, as separate types. And they have counted how many people stop by and how many people actually buy as a result of tasting the jars of jam. And the interesting observation was that where there was a lot of selection, in other words, the 24 jars of jam, more people stopped to browse out of curiosity and say, hmm, let's see, how about this one? How about this one? But far fewer people actually bought anything. In other words, there was so much change that people's minds went, ah, too much change. I'm confused. Nah, yeah, I can't make my mind up. Whereas in the other supermarket, where there were only six different jars of jam, there was slightly less curiosity. Uh, fewer people stopped to, uh, to admire and taste the different jars of jam, but many more people actually bought. So in other words, giving people too much choice is not such a great idea. Having just enough choice is, is optimum. So the constraining the amount of choice is actually a very clever way for ensuring a desirable outcome. The other example that I was going to give in terms of constraints is a classic one, and it's had a profound influence on the history of, of work. Uh, think after the Second World War, the Japanese economy was in tatters. Uh, Japan was seeking to rebuild its industrial capability. So one of the key things required in such an endeavor is develop automobiles and trucks and other such um, vehicles. So a young engineer from Toyota by the name of Taichi Ono um, gets sent to America to figure out how Americans build vehicles and bring some of that know-how to Japan and figure it out. And when Taichi went to America, he essentially um, uh, noticed the habits of American manufacturers and was driven to near despair because he went to America and saw how Americans had lots and lots of sheet metal and therefore were stamping lots and lots and lots of panels. Front right fender, make it a few thousands, fill a huge warehouse with it, then shift the press to the left fender, build another few thousand, fill some more uh, warehouses. It's like, he goes, I can't do this in Japan. I don't have this much metal. I don't have this much land to warehouse all of this stuff. I'm so constrained by how much money I have, how much material I have, how much um, warehouse space I have. I can't do this. It can't be done. So therefore, that necessity, that constraint forced Taiichi and his colleagues to invent the just enough, just in time approach, um, the Kanban approaches and mechanisms, the Andon mechanism of stopping the line and alerting and using that as a means of, of teaching. So most of the lean way of manufacturing, which later on has um, influenced significantly the agile ways of thinking and working as well, is driven by the constraints. So constraints can be tremendously beneficial if we frame them in the right way. Wow, well, Horia, um, thank you for uh, elaborating on constraints. It's not just a bad thing, but it's also a really good thing to have is constraints. And the picture that came to mind is uh, the Formula One car. 
uh, you know, if you look at Formula One and how they operate, is they have to operate within certain constraints as well. Otherwise, you know, you know, risk people's lives. Um, even though it's still risky, you just have to try and minimize that risk. Um, so the constraints that they impose is also about safety. So I think that's really, um, really strong, uh, beautiful example, Steve. Thank you. Um, so moving on to uh, looking into the struggle patterns. Now, if you remember going back to that picture of the polarity map, as again, we're starting at the bottom left, then we'll go to the top right. Uh, I say, I, I notice it says control and trust, but imagine you've Oops. got the agile triangle in the in the in the left, and you've got the uh, the iron triangle on the left, and the agile triangle on the right. So again, we're going to go. What are the um, the, the the key uh, str current struggle patterns with the iron triangle? Then we we'll go to what is the upside of the agile triangle? What's the downside of the agile triangle? What's the upside of the agile of the iron triangle? Uh, and then again, um, looking at what is the combined upside of both agile and iron triangles, and so on. Okay, I hope that explains how we're going to be stepping through this. Now, stepping through the first one here is looking at the current struggle patterns with the iron triangle. We have noticed uh, quite a lot with the panels that we've worked through is we've noticed quite some interesting um, phenomena um, in terms of behaviors, uh, habits in organizations, struggle patterns, and so on. So the first one is around value. Um, <laughs> One of the things that uh, I keep noticing in uh, certain industries is that when you ask people what is, who, who, who stands to gain from the software or the product that you're building, usually the answer is somebody in head office. And usually the frontline or the actual users or customers of what's being produced are forgotten. Uh, so that's why you see there at top right is value for whom. Um, that, that's something we really notice. So, but there's all sorts of other types of behaviors when it comes to interpreting value that we've noticed um, when it comes to the iron triangle. Um, <clears throat> usually value is related to the way that uh, things are being costed instead of actually looking at the outcomes that it delivers to uh, an end customer or user. Other struggle patterns that we noticed with, uh, or that, uh, that, that brings uh, out the worst of the iron triangle is this thing called overburden. Um, and with that, there's quite a lot of uh, different Japanese terms. Um, you must have heard of muda, muri, and, um, or you help me out here? Mura. Mura. Um, <laughs> about those are all forms of overburden. And this is really, you, you manage to get the product out, you manage to deliver what you, do, you, what you promised for your project, but you have totally burned out your team. Um, so there's a human cost that's never really calculated or that's really calculated in the iron triangle. Just to make a quick correction there, um, muda is waste. Mura is unevenness of flow of work, and muri, muri is the overburden, the absurdity. The absurdity, yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway, so moving on, um, the iron triangle, um, I've noticed working with project managers, they really pulled their hair out of their head, trying to balance the, to, the scope, the, uh, the cost, and the time and it's really, really difficult to always keep that in balance or synchronize, especially when you don't know what you don't know up front and you being held accountable to that. So we found that there in situations like that, um, when people or when organizations try to adopt some agile practices, it actually becomes pretty fragile. Um, it's just the, cat, the straw that breaks the camel's back and that causes all sorts of conflict um, in, in the organization. The other thing we've noticed is quality. Uh, quality is usually squeezed at the end of a project. Um, 
those poor testing people. Um, I've been there, I've done that. Um, if you run into problems, the deadline doesn't shift, but uh, the, the, the time to actually help with uh, quality control and uh, quality assurance are just reduced. So they uh, sacrifice quality um, in order to meet the budget scope and time constraints. We've also noticed that um, usually there's some flawed processes involved as well. And our panel that we discussed with this um, have uh, uh, identified some, some patterns around that. So perhaps there's a, a, a override from top management that just throws a spanner into your project work. There's also speed. Um, the iron triangle sometimes has the capability of slowing things down. Um, and that's probably also sometimes a good thing, but also sometimes it's a really bad thing if you are in a really highly competitive market. And that's why you get projects that overrun. Um, we still see regularly in telcos projects that overrun the, the times and then they get leap, leapfrogged by the competition. Then lastly is fear. And you will notice that fear is always a pattern that, we, that we've observed. The Iron Triangle um, was, uh, we've seen instances of um, where it is being used to instill fear in uh, project managers or in delivery teams. Um, and uh, one of the things there is it's you're locked into decisions. There's no, no uh, um, opportunity for you to renegotiate in light of new information. You're locked in in that. Now, part of the upside of the of the um, uh, the value uh, the agile triangle is looking at the desired outcomes, and I'm going to have Aurea uh, talk a little bit about the desired outcomes. That's the upside of the Agile Triangle. Right. So why is considering value, quality, and constraints a really good thing? Well, first and foremost, because it gives you an opportunity to pay attention to what is genuinely valuable. Um, this may seem um, too obvious, right? But we have to remember that value is in the eye of the person making the determination. Um, what that means is there are different constituencies that have different perspectives on value. Uh, if I happen to be um, the uh, managing director of an organization, What's valuable to me is that our organization makes a really good profit. Uh, it's very healthy. Uh, maybe we expand, we grow, we develop our um, market share, right? That's of interest to me as an, as an executive. But if I am a customer, as a customer, I don't really care all that much how much you grow or don't grow or um, how much market share you have. I care that the product that you give me is actually satisfying my needs. So value to me and value to the executive could be completely different. Value to the people doing the work in the organization. Well, uh, that's different. Value to them could be, I wanna be able to enjoy my work, um, really have uh, have fun if we can in the process of creating great products, see that we're contributing well to a thriving economy and society. We're um, really engaged in, in something effective and productive that is putting a smile on people's faces and it's, it's satisfying them well. So balancing these different aspects of value is something really essential. And that's why we see value as a key um, theme here uh, and the need for a deeper understanding of customer needs and value proposition design and figuring out the different aspects of value. Another benefit of considering the Agile Triangle is this ability to understand the whole, seeing the whole, as we call it in the Lean community. Um, a systemic perspective is tremendously beneficial because if we only focus very, very narrowly 
and we don't consider the whole ecosystem, we're losing all sorts of really important side effects. So for instance, an unusual um, discovery was that of trophic cascades, where you discover that by reintroducing wolves in the Yellowstone ecosystem, all of a sudden, even the shapes of the rivers gets to change. And it's really, really fascinating. I encourage you to have a look up on YouTube. We'll include in the description for this podcast, uh, the link to the Trophic Cascade um, video. Seeing the whole, noticing how things influence one another is really, really important. Uh, Equally so, you have another uh, video on unintended consequences. Uh, You have the the classic cats in Borneo um, video where you see that, ooh, um, if you say, oh, we have malaria, help us. Okay, fine, then spray with DDT. Okay, so the DDT spray kills the mosquitoes that provide the malaria, but unfortunately, it also kills some wasps, and the wasps used to control some caterpillars, and the caterpillars, because now there are no wasps, they're eating the thatched roofs of people's houses, so you got rid of malaria, but now people's houses uh, start to get damaged, and not only that, um, all that DDT, well, the geckos will eat the various insects that are poisoned with DDT. So the geckos accumulate a fair amount of DDT and the cats eat the geckos. And when the cat eats the geckos, the cats die because they don't resist DDT as well as the geckos do. So when the cats die, then the rats multiply. So when the rats multiply, then you get plague and you get destruction of grain uh, reserves. (laughs) So whoops, (laughs) now we have a completely different problem because we sprayed with DDT. And that ping pong all of these interdependencies. So what do you do? Well, you have the famous operation cat drop, uh, dropping, uh, air dropping cats into Borneo such that the cat population can then multiply and control the rats and then reduce uh, the challenge. So notice how understanding the whole ecosystem and figuring out how things connect with one another is really essential to achieving great value. And developing a thriving community that can flourish over time. Another aspect of the Agile Triangle when used well is um, a range of benefits that can be labeled under the umbrella of lean. You have fewer handoffs, you can learn through doing, you have a reduction of silliness and absurdity. It has to be about continuous improvement. And different organizations have different ways of, uh, of going about this. Where things have gone not as good as they might have is too often organizations have embraced the, the habits, the practices of lean um, thinkers, but they forgot to embrace the spirit, the intention, the general culture of lean. So our hope is that by focusing attention on the Agile and Iron Triangle, we can help people to discern some of the implications and the the benefits of the lean mindset more broadly than just here are some techniques to use. Now, another aspect of the Agile Triangle is this ability to align with strong purpose. Purpose is then also very closely related to to value. Ultimately, it comes down to figuring out um, what kinds of behaviors do we encourage? Depending on what incentives are there or what, shall we say, admonishments are there, that will trigger by implication certain behaviors. If I reward um, sales per, salespeople, for instance, for the value of the deal as signed, then salespeople will be incentivized to make ridiculous promises and sell huge deals so that they can get a really nice commission. If, on the other hand, I balance that and say, right, yes, we want uh, a decent sale, but I want to see how much actual revenue over the first, I don't know, pick a, pick a period, uh, 
call it 12 months, call it 24 months, call it possibly even longer, how much revenue does that um, sale actually generate? Then all of a sudden, um, if I sell a deal and it turns out that the customer has changed their mind and no, actually the actual revenue is just a tiny fraction of that, then you're not getting a revenue uh, that's outsized, that's not manifested in actual follow-through value. It's actually inspired by the actual value that you deliver. So pretty soon then salespeople will be incentivized to pay attention to what can actually be delivered reliably. What's the outcome that we can actually generate? And if, even if I sell something maybe a little bit smaller to begin with, and then I build good trust with the customer and they go, yay, that was awesome. Give us more. Then you get rewarded for the, over the lifetime of the relationship value. Hey, all of a sudden, again, everybody win, win, win. Um, you get a different result. And that comes back to purpose and incentives. How do we do that? Well, another aspect of getting the, Agile triangle to work well is transparency, uh, building visibility and transparency. This is an opportunity for us to consider that, remember, there are a number of these tensions, and there's one that talks about balancing safety with courage. Now, transparency is very closely related to the necessity for courage and safety, because if I want to be transparent and I'm afraid, I'm not going to be able to. Um, you may be familiar with the idea of the watermelon effect. Uh, look at my project. It's green, it's green, it's green. Oops, it's red. In other words, um, through various cultural habits, people are encouraged to report things as if everything is going fine. Show me a red, amber, green language. It's green. We're all good. When in fact, no, we're kind of struggling with this and that's not quite working. So that's not transparency. Um, so therefore, if you have the Agile Triangle um, sort of dealt with well, you're clear about what is truly valuable, what is the true level of quality, what are the actual constraints. So therefore, cultivating visibility and transparency gets you away from habits like the watermelon effect. And finally, um, the last aspect that we've highlighted is this idea of evolution. Um, there has to be a good opportunity to evolve products and consider things from an economic perspective. Um, what's challenging is that um, in quite a few occasions, we have a, a stakeholder community, uh, let's call them customers, and they want um, to have something done for them, let's say in the context of an organization. So there's an internal customer community. And the organization will say, right, let's have a project for this. And we create the project. And then we say, yep, well, funds ran out. There you have it. This is it. And oftentimes, unfortunately, the stakeholder community goes, yeah, but this is not enough. I need more stuff. What about this? And what about that? And what about the other? Oh, so if that's how you're going to behave, then I'm going to ask for everything in the kitchen sink. So the evolution of needs and the evolution of products is something really, really important to understand. So rather than thinking, here's a project and therefore we're going to have to try and achieve as much as we possibly can and ask for as much as we possibly can in that project, instead of that, maybe we take more of a product perspective and we build a few minimal learning increments, we see how effective they are, and then we keep building on that and we develop a product. I mean, if you're asking, what's the difference between a product and a project? A project, by definition, is a temporary endeavor. It has a start, a finish, and you will have um, a certain amount of people, a certain amount of time, a certain amount of scope that you can invest in that project. That's it. A product, on the other hand, is driven by economic necessity. So for instance, us humans, we have this magical technology called soap. And what do we do with soap? Well, we mix it with water, we throw it down the drain. And when we run out of soap, what do we do? We go to the shop, we buy some more soap, and we repeat the process until such time that we invent a different technology. So that project, that product, because it's beneficial, it's useful, it uh, provides benefits of cleaning and 
sanitizing, we're going to keep using it. So similarly, in an organization, the way of running the organization has certain needs. We have to use certain products in doing our work routinely. Therefore, rather than thinking in terms of projects, we ought to think in terms of what are the products that we need to do our work. And therefore, this evolution of how do we change our way of work, how do we change the products um, that we do the work with, this evolution and change is what um, balancing the National Triangle well is all about. Okay, so we'll be looking at uh, risks when going rampant onto the Agile Triangle and just um, not balancing that well enough. So the downsides of the R and Triangle. Um, when we discussed this with the panels, one of the groups uh, of ideas that came out was in balanced decisions. And we've all seen all sorts of uh, examples of how decision-making um, isn't really balanced. Um, either there's decision latency, or there's too many decision makers or too many layers of decision making. Um, one of the customers that uh, we help regularly, uh, there's a real trend now that we've noticed about delayed decision making or uh, decision latency. And usually the organization loses opportunities or um, has got uh, 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 quite a, a costly um, uh, after effect of not being able to make decisions in time. Um, in connection with that is also compliance that's not balanced. It's either too much or too little. Um, there isn't a real balance uh, in, in compliance. So when you look at the Agile Triangle, it will leave um, the, the, the team uh, or the organization in uh, one bad shape uh, on the one side and bad form in the other. Lastly, with the downside of the Agile Triangle, um, things that to look out for is uh, these habits where uh, inattention is paid to value, um, or there's very in little, there's very little attention paid to value. Um, and we, one of the things that we noticed there is Horia talked about chartering earlier is, is that. <laughs> One of the things is we see some organizations that's embraced the Agile Triangle has got this mantra of just start with the work. We don't need to do chartering um, and we don't need to charter uh, this. Uh, everybody's already got the, got the ideas uh, and got the decisions um, made. You just need to get on with the work. So the team's not really brought along to understand what value it is. Uh, that they've provided. Um, looking at the upside of the, or the benefits of the iron triangle, I'll be handing that back to Horia to discuss. Okay. So this essentially says, we wanna see what's really good if we have a good grip of the time, the budget and the scope, right? Well, first and foremost, if I have a whale-oiled machine that delivers really well, very capably, I have good reliability. I know what to expect. In um, thinking about process um, management and visualizing processes, we have the concept of process stability. If I say a, pro a process is stable, I want to know that every step in the process has two qualities. One, it has to be capable and it has to be available. In other words, if I approach a particular process step and I ask this process step, give me your result. I promise to give you good inputs, you give me good outputs. If reliably that process step gives me good outputs, I can say, yep, this process step is capable. Now, if I have a capable process step, but the process step says, nah, I'm busy, come back in three weeks, then it may not be particularly available. So by combining capability with availability, I end up with stability. In other words, I know that within a particular time range, if I provide good inputs, I get good outputs, that gives me a reliable output. So achieving 
process stability, capability and availability in every step of a process gives me a good reliable process. I provide the right inputs, I get the right outputs. Hey, I have a, a nice result, right? So this is how I get uh, good forecasting, good predictability of um, delivery, right? Now, also, if I have this clarity of availability and capability, I also get transparency. I get high levels of visibility and good control. I notice what is actually happening. I can actually take action. I also have really good accountability and I can have good drive because we can see this is what we're delivering. This is what's happening. Um, we don't have a lot of um, indecision. We're making good choices. We keep learning and getting better over time. That's really effective. I also can have a uh, really good purpose because I know here's the time that I must meet. Here's the scope that I want to accomplish by then. Is it accomplishable? Is it humanly achievable? Yes, it is. Awesome. Let's keep at it. Hey, we did it. Very good. Well done. Uh, a really nice example in this space is, for instance, an organization in Brazil called Semco. Uh, and they have an interesting habit of forming a clear idea as to what their capacity for production is. So they tell their salespeople, look, uh, there's this many units that um, you can sell. Call it 10. If you've sold a 10 and it's Tuesday, don't go to work on Wednesday. You sold your 10 units. Don't keep going and selling more and more and more because that's going to give us a lot of hassle. Instead, go home, play with your kids, go to the beach, enjoy life and really understand what is the true effective capacity. Because if you sell too much, then, hey, we're going to have to buy more land, build more factories, uh, or acquire other people. That's too much hassle. Let's not do that. Let's agree what's a reasonable sort of capacity for our organization. Let's meet those capacity elements, and we're good. And that is very effective. It's very beneficial for the organization. So understanding your purpose and connecting well with that purpose is really, really useful. Uh, and finally, um, you have compliance uh, that works well. You can stay out of jail. Um, you can um, discharge your fiduciary responsibility really, really well. You can be audited and not have an issue because, hey, you have your time under control, your scope under control, your budget under control. All good. Yeah, to stay out of jail is a is a really big draw card. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh yeah, for for executives, um, the overall purpose is this is looking at the upside of both the agile and iron triangles, and what is the the overall the greater purpose statement? If we have that in our balance, if we have that in the thriving zone on our galaxy map. And the first one is the ability to balance constraints uh, in a very realistic way. Um, and uh, we, we notice that things like discipline is, is, plays a key role in, um, in that. So if we see discipline delivery um, in the way teams uh, uh, deliver products or services, that's one of the, the hallmarks of this uh, constraints that's, that's really well balanced. Um, the first thing that comes to mind when you have balanced constraints is it's actually very transparent. So those constraints are very transparent to everybody in Sunda, and they're able to actually um, see the, why those constraints exist. Uh, remember, constraints can be positive and negative, um, but it is visible and it serves as early warning that, uh, and it helps people to actually ask questions early enough. It's a, it's a form of a, a short feedback loop. Um, you want those things in place um, because it helps you to course correct when things uh, go wrong. So you can anticipate, you're, you're more in an anticipatory space instead of reactive in your organization. One thing we noticed as well with the discussions is when our, at the RN and Agile triangles are in balance, it actually promotes learning in the organization and in teams. Um, and that, that was a, a surprise for us uh, when we discussed that. And 
it 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 is really looking into the value of continued learning in the organization. Um, that means you can continuously deal with those uh, VUCA uh, elements or with the variability that the the marketplace can bring uh, bring to us. Um, about two weeks ago, um, by the time of this recording, um, Russia has um, <clears throat> so invaded Ukraine. And um, for many parts of the organization, um, the signs uh, for many parts of the world, the, the signs were there in, in organ to, for everybody to be to to take note of it. But um, a lot of organizations were still caught uh, unawares with with that. So by learning and, and noticing things, it teaches us to be more resilient in those VUCA uh, elements out there. And then lastly, uh, this is where some of the softer things comes into play is um, when you've got these two in balance, you move beyond blame. Um, so you don't have those traditional um, situations where the project manager blames the supplier and the supplier blames the, the customers and so on. You, you, you don't sit with those types of um, situations. Is that it is factual, it is very clear, and you can move beyond blaming and actually dealing with the issues as they arise. Now looking um, into the next panel, and this is what is the downside if we get both out of whack? Korea. Yeah, what are we afraid of? What don't we want to, to mm -hmm. see at all, right? Well, it's almost a, a mirror image because humans do not like uncertainty. Uh, life is hard enough as it is. I don't want to be unsure where my next meal is coming from. I want to be comfortable that, yeah, I'm looked after, I'm safe. Um, nothing's coming to get me. I can um, sustain myself and my family on good. So uncertainty is something that we're, we're much afraid of. And the thing is, if we don't get the balance right of value quality and constraints, if we don't get the balance right of the time, the budget and the scope, then all sorts of unpleasant things are going to happen. I'm going to create a product that nobody likes. So I'm going to invest a lot of time, effort and energy into things that are not all that good. And that's a really tough message. It really destroys people's perspective of themselves. Because some people um, have such an idea that, oh, I think we're doing a fabulous job. And then they might discover that, oh, actually, you know what? If you're in the business of building software intensive systems, traditionally, um, anywhere from 40 to 60% of the feature set of your deployed system nobody much cares to use it if we think in terms of what's our usual experience with something like a word processor or a spreadsheet application how many of the features of the sort of leading solutions out there do we actually use well the answer is very little lots of those features mm, very few power users ever get to use and most power users don't get to use all of those features so in many systems there's lots and lots of features that a lot of time effort and energy gets invested in that mm, nobody cares about all that much so that costs a lot of money so that is quite wasteful and it was only uh, viable because uh, people could make such ridiculous profits um, in the first place. And therefore, they could afford to waste quite a lot. Now, because we have so many more organizations that rely on software these days, um, this uncertainty about am I going to get any value out of what I'm putting into this software system or not, that becomes less and less desirable, right? Um, there's also um, a lot of fear around value. Um, value can be suspect. Uh, are we sure this is going to be valuable? How sure are we? How do we know for sure? Um, I might have a worse experience. So for instance, um, I've come across a situation where um, an organization decided to 
transform its um, systems from uh, something that was using mainframes to something that was using mid-range mid -range systems. And unfortunately, they didn't go and pay attention to how the people were actually using those systems. So when the web-based system was implemented, it had a lot of mousing and clicking and so on. So therefore, the pattern of usage was so much slower than what people were accustomed to using. And when people's incentives are driven by how many units they can actually process per hour, and that all of a sudden doubles, you go, oh, I used to process 50, and now I can barely uh, get 25. That makes a huge, huge dent into the benefit, right? It makes things much worse rather than at least uh, the same, if not better. So getting the right kind of value, making sure that if I'm creating a new product or I'm providing a new enhancement, that actually makes things better, not worse. Well, that's something that really needs to be uh, paid attention to. Lack of clarity, right? What happens if we're not really pay, paying close attention? Well, we talked about the watermelon effect earlier. If what I'm reporting is divorced from what is actually happening, um, and I'm effectively playing hooky with the truth, I'm, I'm not really being truthful, then we can have oh, not enough actual delivery, not enough quality. Um, we might have all sorts of other challenges. Now, another thing that uh, often happens, unfortunately, is uh, a whole lot of challenge around um, failure and blame. Uh, too often in um, organizations, we are accustomed to uh, the necessity for success. We must succeed. There, there can be no room for, uh, for failure. If I say failure is not an option, well, then uh, what's happening sometimes is I ask for the impossible. We will make 57 widgets, but practically we can only make three per week, but I'm asking for 57. And failure is not an option, but hey, because humanly we can only make three, we made three, and then uh, I can be upset and say, see, you failed. Um, you didn't do 57, you only made three. Oh, what manner of poor useless people are you? You only made three, right? So then I blame the people to say, you you couldn't do 57, what manner of, of um, capability is this? You obviously have no skill. You should be able to do 57. Well, hold on a second. Um, if you're the leader and if you know that your people can do about three and you're asking for 57, whose failure is it? Well, it's not the failure of the people because you asked for something that you didn't have evidence that's achievable to uh, accomplish. So therefore, it's not the people to be blamed. Take ownership. As Jocko Willing puts it, take extreme ownership and say, it's my fault. I didn't make sure that you had the right capability. I didn't make sure you had the right training. I didn't make sure you could actually deliver this much in um, that unit of time. So things like death marches and other um, um, fears and, uh, and misbehaviors are likely to happen if we don't have a good grip on what's happening. Because there's no excuse for having a death march in, in, in our estimation. If you're tempted to push for a death march, then recognize what is actually going on and discover an alternative. Yes, Aldo? Maybe there may be some viewers that um, don't know what a death march is mm. uh, or death march projects are. That's right. Tell us about it, Aldo. Um, okay, it's like, it's one of these projects, I've been on a few of them, is um, it just never ends. It's always the one thing on the other and the other. It feels like there's no, no end to the project um, or to end to actually getting to a delivery date. It feels like the, um, the, um, the, the finish line always gets moved and uh, by the time you blink, you're working 12 hour days, you're overworked, your family is taking strain and, and all of those types of things. That's, that's one of that's some of the examples or the hallmarks of 
um, these March projects. Um, look out for those behaviors um, or look out for those signs. Um, it's, it's, it's all signs of a potential death march project. Yeah. In a nutshell, a death march is a project in which we know we're not going to make it, right? This comes from the days of, I have a project, this is the scope. The scope says we have to make 57 things and we've only made seven and there's 50 more to go, but there's only one month left. And we spent 12 months already. So whoops, making another 50 in the last month, nah. And throwing, and throwing more people at the problem is not going to help either <laughs> because um, that, that's another trick that, that we notice with these March projects is um, decision makers would throw more people at the problem. And that, you know, the, the saying of nine women cannot have, make a baby in a month um, comes to mind. So these are all um, signs of a death march. That's right. Fred Brooks uh, has a classic uh, book of essays called The Mythical Man Month. And one of his saying there is throwing manpower uh, at a late project is only going to make it later. But yeah. this is a sort of, I think it must be at least 50 years old, that book, but it's still as topical today as it ever was. Thank you, Horia. Right. So um, that was on, on failure and blame. Um, Renee Brown talks about the importance of vulnerability and um, letting go of blame. Um, most of us will have been members of Blamers Anonymous at uh, some point or another in our lives. Um, it blaming someone or something feels so seductive, like I got it off my chest. See, that's at fault. That did it. Uh, to me, right? I was oppressed. I was victimized by such and such. Well, um, yeah, sure. In some cases, that may well be the case. However, uh, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. So yes, these things may happen. Yes, failure may happen. But how do we learn how to fall gracefully rather than fail miserably? Because there's also degrees of failure, right? Because ultimately, how do we learn? How do we grow? We learn by trying things out and them not quite working, and then we try better. Remember when you learn to walk, nobody teaches you how to walk but yourself. You try and stand up and kind of get a grip of your body and learn how to walk, and you're going to fall a little bit, and it's going to be okay because usually as a kid, you're recovering really rapidly, your center of gravity is really low, the damage that you inflict upon yourself out of falling is a non issue not a problem at all. So you keep on falling safely most of the time and you keep on growing and hey, you learn how to walk, you learn how to run, all good. Finally, the last aspect is uh, the fear of sort of um, transparency related um, challenges where people abdicate uh, responsibility and accountability, particularly by misunderstanding some of the lean and agile concepts to say, hey, um, uh, it's on you, you're a self-organizing team, you figure it out. Um, then you might say, um, yeah, 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 I know you want me to resolve that for you, but I'm not sure uh, what to do. Uh, then you sit on the problem for a while and then it becomes acute and then, hey, I worked through the night and I, I've solved it. It's like, hold on a second, this did not need to be so acute in the first place, right? So that's a, a false heroism kind of thing, yeah? So there are situations like that uh, that, uh, that may occur from time to time. Well, let's have a look at what actions, what skills can we bring to bear to actually get a better balance between the iron and the agile triangles? Thank you, Horia. Um, so these are things that we can try actions and skills um, that would keep us in that thriving zone. And one of the first things is to actually embrace the power of teams. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, uh, examples and research that talks about the power of teams. So for instance, one of the things is uh, the non-solo work, um, that's a, a, something that Discipline Agile sometimes talk about, is doing non-solo work as an option. And that means that um, you can do pay work or mobbing, but it actually drives a collaborative approach. Um, 
many sets of eyes actually on the same problem really gets to the most elegant solution in that specific context. So focus on teams or teamwork, uh, get, get a team dynamic going when you are planning, when you are trying to track progress is involve the team in that. Another aspect that uh, we found uh, was really valuable, uh, pun intended, is to focus on the value management. And there's a plethora of techniques and methods and practices and skills that you can build around value management. One of the things that we did with an international customer, a multinational um, last year, is, is we challenged them on what their definition of value was. And we actually worked through a number of weeks with them to figure out a new definition of value. And that was not just a dollar bottom value uh, on their balance sheet. We included a lot of other aspects. And because we went through that um, exercise with the customer, they realized that they were producing products that nobody's using. They were actually having warehouses full of stock that nobody's buying just because we started asking uh, questions and bringing in some thinking um, in uh, around value and value for who um, that was a really great uh, experience to go through the customer and as we're talking is they are actually decommissioning whole product lines based on the discussion we've had uh, with them last year around value management. Um, I think value um, ma management is um, underutilized or underrated in many organizations, especially traditional organizations. So if we focus on that and get some really good habits and practices uh, around value management, um, we've seen some great results around that. The other th um, things that we can do is build a bigger awareness of what does balance mean between the R and the Agile triangles. And this includes metrics as well as constraints and all of those things is build that awareness, but bring in the um, transparency around what is it that we're trying to balance here and for our products or, or projects. Um, You'll also notice that there are certain things that we can implement uh, around quality. Um, for instance, um, I know uh, one of my mentors, Janet Gregory, would feel very proud for mentioning this, but take a test first approach. Bring in that acceptance test driven development that they wrote two books about. Um, it is really, really an imp uh, important practice um, to help building quality right from the start. Once you understand the value, then you can tune the quality based on, on that value. Then the last one is um, leadership. And this is about promoting leader, leader culture, what that David Markay talks about. And the more you focus on nurturing that, that specific aspects of leader, leader culture, you'll notice that there's a lot more aspects of the Aaron and Agile Triangle that becomes balanced. Now, if you want to know more about Leader Leader, you can go and have a look at what they say over at intentbasedleadership.com and we'll share the link as well later on um, in, the, uh, in the materials. Now that we've had a look at um, what are the actions and things and skills that you can focus on um, for making sure that you've got a really good balance between the Agile and um, Iron Triangles. Let's look at the warning signs. What are the things that you can actually measure or observe to warn you that, hey, we're slipping back on the Iron or the uh, Agile Triangle? Mm. So uh, conflict is a really interesting uh, warning sign. The most interesting bit is it's the quality of the conflict. It's how do we approach the conflict? Because to get good at anything, you have to cultivate what Adam Grant calls a challenge network. People that don't agree with you. Because if everybody agrees with you, then you're in groupthink. 
you're not noticing perspectives that your initiative is likely to encounter out there in the world to get good. You need to test your thinking against other perspectives. And if it stands the test of time, then it's good. But if you're avoiding conflict, if you're shutting down conflict, if you say, hey, well, no, hey, um, it's the executive that said so, it's the, the minister said so, the, this person said so, you reference the highest paid person's opinion, right? That's the hippo. Then that's a challenge, right? If you see people kind of hiding be behind um, these um, reasons, if you will, go out of. I worked with a customer that um, they regularly brought made projects more important um, than it usually were because the quote and unquote the minister said so. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, that's a uh, watch out for that one. Well, it's this idea of status, right? I'm associated with such and such. I have the ear of such and such. I'm conveying the authority of such and such. Look at me, how important I am, right? <laughs> As opposed to, well, if that's a silly idea, it's still a silly idea. Let's figure out a way of noticing together that it's a silly idea and let's stop throwing good money after bad and let's do something better instead. Because ultimately all of us suffer uh, doing it just because such and such said so and they didn't consider what is actually going on. That's, again, not a good idea. And history is full of examples of why not to do that. Now, you might imagine our attitude is fairly um, gentle and playful. Uh, to a certain extent, what we're doing here in this podcast is we're playing court jesters. The court jester is a really interesting concept, and we, we may have mentioned it before, but I'll, I'll make a mention of it here again. The court jester is the person that speaks truth to the people in authority, and it takes courage to do so. This is what Comedians do. Comedians um, tell us things that are funny. But when we think of some of them, we go, oh, wow, yeah, that's right. But this is how we see things. And it is funny. Um, but to get better, we need to test the boundaries of our ability for conflict. And we need to learn what is better, what is more effective. So noticing humor, noticing conflict, noticing the avoidance of conflict is really essential for figuring out how do we get better at balancing value, quality, and constraints. Now, absence of trust. If you want to predict um, how effective a team is going to be, you just look at how much they trust one another. Because if people don't trust one another, they're going to be very cautious. They're not going to rely really on one another because I, I don't trust her, I don't trust him, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to do it all myself. So we can't really build on each other's plays. We can't really move particularly fast. Uh, Stephen M. R. Covey has a wonderful book called The Speed of Trust, warmly recommended. Uh, talks about uh, the flip side of this, right? So um, how do we build trust? How do we ensure that uh, we don't have... Um, too much of the silo behavior going on. Remember how we talked about uh, the important uh, the importance of um, seeing the whole and having a, a systemic uh, perspective. Um, that is absolutely essential. We need to see how our well-intentioned local behaviors may lead to um, unintentional um, difficulties and drawbacks in a broader uh, context. Uh, another book that comes to mind there is uh, uh, Peter Senge's um, The Fifth Discipline about systems thinking and creating learning organizations. And um, the next element to, to consider is what we call the failure to slice. Uh, this has to do with the idea of people trying to, to work on, on chunks that are way too big. You don't have to have huge chunks 
you can work on chunks that are smaller you can work on smaller slices and understand uh, a slice not as a small component but a slice of functionality that completes a customer journey um, element from start to finish so therefore you learn actively what's good so when people um, um, engage in things like um, they call it a minimum viable product and it's actually a huge thing right the customer journey map is missing you don't really understand what needs to be where and then hey when in reality you notice what's actually happening for the customer well could we have anticipated that yeah we could have if we would have had a customer journey map so yeah, uh, that's, when, about, that's about um trying to eat the elephant in one big um, mm. bite instead of eating the elephant one bite at a time yeah, yeah. or elephant carpaccio as a friend of ours uh, yeah. likes to call it right <laughs> thin thin slivers of, uh, of of elephant yeah and finally, um, uh, there are all sorts of potential quality challenges when uh, we have people, again, very, very well intentioned, but not sufficiently well informed, make pronouncements like everybody in our organization will use this specific way of work in this particular fashion, not paying attention to the nuances and the characteristics of each particular team's context. And when everybody has to implement exactly the same routine that doesn't go well because humans are not sprockets humans are different they have different skills different backgrounds different abilities what some teams do in a day another team needs a month yeah unfortunately it's the it's the nature of the universe this is what happens from time to time so um, we really need to be clever we need to be effective in noticing and tailoring our ways of work accordingly understanding our definitions of done our definitions of ready uh having the discipline as jocko willing puts it discipline set you free uh embracing the right kind of discipline gets really great results and again a lot of people have the misconception that uh agile and lean ways of work are just for cowboys that um hide behind the excuse of yeah we, we do whatever the heck we want because we're agile well no that's not what that means because that then leads to significant degradations of quality. So um, then one, of the, one just to worry, just one on that. One of the quickest way to determine whether quality is suspect is to check whether a team has got a specific set of definitions of ready or done. That's immediately a, a signal that um, something is not right um, uh, around quality. Mm. So this, at, uh, at the good clip of speed, was the iron and agile triangle balance. So um, in the next episode, we'll be looking at the next polarity pair. Um, but for this episode, again, the invitation is open uh, for you to comment. Um, to tell us what we may have missed. Uh, remember, that's the whole idea, is to share what we have and to learn from others as well. Um, so if you are a specific um, uh, body of knowledge or you've got significant experience in this space, um, contact us. We'll be happy to interview you uh, on one of these uh, sessions or let us know what we may have missed. Um, Thank you for listening. This was episode four of The Focus. Um, I'm Aldo Rol. And, and I'm Horia Soshansky. Thank you so much. See you, See you next soon. Time.